and welcome back to The Daily Planet, our roundup of all the news from Planet Under Pressure. Now, in spite of the show's title, I am not Clark Kent. He wasn't bald for a start, so I can only dream of being Superman. I'm Julian Rush, and in the next half hour, we'll be tackling what is perhaps the most important thing that underpins the whole conference. That's turning the warnings that are now coming loud and clear from the world's scientists into actions by the world's politicians and governments. Well, the message from scientists at this Planet Under Pressure conference couldn't be clearer. Ecologically, we're living beyond our means and we're running out of time to do something about it. Coming up, we discuss the real difficulty of translating that message into action by politicians. And we look too at how the world has reacted to past sudden changes in the climate and try to learn the lessons from geology. But first, let's turn to ecosystems. Earlier this morning, if you've been following the plenary sessions on our webcast, you'll have heard Professor Sandra Diaz of Cordoba National University in Argentina give her assessment of the challenges facing the world's ecosystems. And I'm pleased to say that she's now with me on The Daily Planet. Uh, welcome, Sandra. Um, how bad are the world's ecosystems now and biodiversity? What sort of state are we really in? Well, um... In short, they are in a very bad situation. Ecosystems are shrinking, we are losing species, and what is worse, the whole fabric of ecosystems, the whole fabric of life is not only shrinking, but it's also changing shape because we are favoring some particular kind of organisms and disfavoring other particular kinds. We hear a lot about losing forests, we hear a, a, a lot about losing biodiversity. Yes. Have we reached a point yet where it tips to a point of no return, where we can't get back forests, we can't get back biodiversity? Well, fortunately, living ecosystems are extremely resilient. So we haven't yet reached the points of no return in most of the planet's ecosystems, but we are quite close. By quite close, you mean uh, how long? I know it's hard Well, for overall, example, but... for coral reefs, um, by the end of uh, this century, if uh, we don't stop the, the joint pressures of coastal development and acidification and warming, we may have no coral reefs left by the end of this century, for example. And it's the, the tipping points are different for, our, for very different ecosystems, but they are all getting close to some kind of tipping points, unless you go for really simplified, very altered ecosystems. So what needs to be done? Well, uh, first we need to go for the root causes of biodiversity loss, yes. So the societal uh, drivers that are uh, making us use more and more land every day, um, the um, lifestyles that uh, lead to more and more consumption, therefore we need more fuel, we need uh, more biofuels, we need to cut more forests, we need to pollute more water, we need to use more fertilizers. If we don't tackle those root causes, just protecting tiny bits of ecosystems is not going to work in the, large, in the long term. There's a danger, isn't there, particularly with biodiversity, that we end up with small islands of yes. kind of protected areas yeah. which are not connected together. How bad a loss would that be? And is that a likely scenario Well, for the future? I mean, it could likely be. If we only go for protecting bits and leave the rest to its own destiny, then it will be very bad. Um, the protected areas are some kind of the emergency room. Okay, this, is, this is ecosystem is being lost fast, let's, let's protect a bit, okay, just in case. But we need to address the causes that are making the, all the matrix in which the protected area is placed to degrade fast. So we need to, some people use the word, I don't like it, but some people use the, race, the, the word mainstreaming biodiversity, which means make biodiversity have the value it really has for our lives. Understand that ecosystems are not just machines, they are a fabric 
and the fabric is made by different uh, ecosystems, uh, sorry, species. And we need to preserve that fabric, and this fabric is very, very valuable. What should happen at Rio Plus 20 to ensure that we can protect ecosystems in the future? What needs to come out of that conference? Well, if I had to choose two things, I mean, I, I have a long list, but if I had to choose two things, I would say, first, make sure we give proper importance to biodiversity. I'm not only talking about valuing it in terms of money. Some aspects of biodiversity can be valued in, in monetary terms, but even if we are valuing it in human terms, in importance for us, make sure that the value of biodiversity is factoring in business, in land use management, in the decisions that governments and the private sectors take. That's one. And the other one that probably needs to come from Rio is change governance systems. Um, most of the government, governance systems now are extremely bad for managing biodiversity. Just take a very simple one. Uh, transboundary ecosystems, watersheds that go from one country to the other or, or just go many countries. It's not possible to protect it unless there is a government, governance system that is international or regional. So we need to change that. Class, political world. Uh, we'll run out of time, but Professor Sandra Diaz, thank you very much indeed thank you. for joining us on The Daily Planet. Okay. And talking of political will, it is the biggest problem facing the world at Rio plus 20 in June, which is now just 87 days away. The world scientists are, as I said, warning that time is running out, but are the world's politicians listening? They may say they're committed and they want to do something, but will the short-term demands on them, like trying to recover from the global economic crisis at the moment, for example, just simply override their willingness to take the long-term view. Well, earlier this morning, the conference heard from Britain's Environment Minister, Caroline Spellman. I spoke to her earlier and put it to her that, as she said in her speech, politicians know the evidence, and they know what to do, and they've known it for a while, but the reality is that they've done nothing, so they've failed. Well, too soon to say. What we really need for the Rio Plus 20 summit is political will. Uh, my great friend Isabella Teixeira, who's the Brazilian Environment Minister, um, is a great one for underlying the importance of that. And I do believe there is a real momentum building now for a successful outcome in Rio. We've supported the Colombian proposal for sustainable development goals, and I think they could be a really tangible outcome from the Rio Plus 20 summit. But it's a huge challenge. I mean, political will, it's fine saying it, but actually getting governments to agree to do something and then to actually do it, given that they really only ever act in their own self-interest, is an incredible challenge, isn't it? I think it's a rather negative view. And I think when you particularly listen to young people, they want to hear a more positive approach from this generation of politicians. And certainly this country has put its money where its mouth is. From Since the original Earth Summit in 1992, uh, we have set up and run, for example, the Darwin Project, putting £88 million worth of funding towards arresting the loss of species in over 700 projects in 150 countries. So this is something that developed and developing nations need to do together. And one of my points is sustainable development goals are, of course, universal. They're for everyone and unite all politicians in an endeavour to put the planet on a more sustainable basis. You highlighted the importance of the need for green economics in your, uh, in your speech this morning. Um, and I guess it's at the heart of the conflict over sustainability. This is this conflict between economics and consumption and doing things green and sustainably. The UK is setting up a, national, a natural capital committee, which is, I guess, a kind of attempt to, to do green economics. What will that do and what will be, hopefully, the outcomes of that committee in, in the ways that it will change British government policy? Well, I want to nail the myth that you can't be green and growing, because that is simply not true. And setting up a natural capital committee will mean that it reports directly into the Chancellor of the Exchequer in this country. And that is one of the ways that you can ensure that the national national accounts are greened. Her Majesty's Treasury already have a green book, but this is one more tool in the toolkit to make sure that we take 
proper account of natural capital in our decision making. But how do you envisage changing government policy? Would it mean that perhaps decisions which perhaps would have been taken in the old days because they were the economic thing to do might be taken in a different way or and maybe not taken at all, rejected because there were social or equitable or environmental reasons for doing so? That, that that things that would have been done on economic grounds in the past won't be done in the future? I think it will change the way we make decisions because we will understand better the value of what nature has been providing us for free. As long as nature's uh, value was factored in uh, at zero or for free, it's going to end up with imperfect decision making. So new tools like the National Ecosystem Assessment allow us to correctly quantify what it is that nature provides, the intrinsic natural social capital which uh, nature has been providing us with that needs to be part of a decision. This is a conference of scientists, and one of the leading scientists here, of course, is your own chief scientist at your department, uh, Sir Bob Watson. He spoke yesterday evening of the true importance of consumption as being the really difficult challenge ahead. And that poses real issues for politicians in rich countries like Britain, like yourself, for example. How do you tell the people of Britain, the people of rich countries like the United States and so on, that they might have to consume less in order to be able to live fairly and equitably in the world in the future? You're not going to do it, are you? That's just a vote loser. I think people do want to change. Um, we want to be the first generation that leaves the planet in a better state than when we inherited it. And I think people want to be able to make choices that help the planet and make it more sustainable. If you talk to retailers, they'll tell you that um, customers are actually asking them for which products are more sustainable on their shelves. And I think our job, uh, both uh, as politicians but also uh, with business, is to try and help people do the right thing. Well, joining me now to discuss the issues around Rio Plus 20, I'm joined by one of the conference co-chairs, uh, Mark Stafford-Smith from CSIRO in Australia, where he directs the Climate Adaptation Flagship Programme, by Lydia Brito, the Director of Science Policy and Capacity Building for UNESCO, and Georgios Kostakos, who's an advisor to the UN Secretary General on sustainability and part of the UN Global Sustainability Panel, which produced a report recently called Resilient People, Resilient Planet, that they delivered to the UN Secretary General in January. Uh, welcome all. Can I, I start with you, Mark, as I suppose one of the co-chairs of this conference. What is the, the key message that needs to come out of this conference from all the scientists gathered here, the 3,000 or so delegates, that goes to Rio plus 20? What's the key message that has to come out? Well, I think the highest level key message really is about urgency. And I know that's something the science community has been saying for a long time, but I think there are reasons why we have a heightened understanding of why it's urgent, how complex and interconnected issues are. Um, but really, uh, people aren't going to act on an urgent message, uh, you know, a, a message of urgency, unless there are options there. And we need the leadership to take, uh, to take action on those options. And I think the conference is really trying to identify a whole series of those options to put on the table. Briefly, for example, what? what sort of options might there be? Well, at the UN sort of level, I, I mean, one of the major things we really have to do is to start integrating the so-called three pillars, environment, economics and, and social pillars, far more profoundly. At the moment, we tend to try and bring people out of poverty, but without thinking about the trade-off issues to do with environment or, uh, and, and so forth. We think, about, um, we think about trying to save the environment, but without thinking about the implications on livelihoods and so on. Much more profoundly, I think, in the sort of goals that we set ourselves for the future at a global level and at national and subnational levels, uh, we need to profoundly integrate those things. And science can help with that, but of course it needs leadership. Lydia Brito, uh, Mark there mentioned uh, the social and economics. The world is very divided between rich and poor, between north and south, between developed and developing countries. Is it possible to square that circle of the demand, even the right, for developing countries to develop successfully? but also to develop sustainably without restrictions upon them, without them losing out, if you like? Um, I think that the, the question you are posing is it's an important question and has been posed even today uh, during the discussions. Uh, and probably the answer is it's that development is defined by whom and to benefit whom. And sometimes we 
uh, have a very narrow and, and, and single definition of, of what is development. Uh, and, and I think that the, the, the major task and challenge, and again science has to play a role there in, in the dialogue with politicians, with industry, with society, is looking at sustainable development not just as a single path, but really that communities, individuals and communities are sufficiently equipped with knowledge to make wise decisions how they want to develop. And that means not to defend one model of development, but really several models that are interconnected, mm -hmm. that are supportive, and that ba balance themselves. Uh, and, and rarely you see this in the discussion. You see one kind of model, mm -hmm. and, and, and Mark just mentioned about new goals, uh, how do you measure those goals, how do you in integrate culture in the development agendas, how does science becomes the uh, let's say, the, the building pillars of sustainable agendas. So all these questions uh, we hope will be discussed during this, this, this uh, conference because luckily we have many, many scientists, but we also have policy makers, we have industry with us, we have, we have civil society, and we feel that this, uh, this conference uh, it's really one of the places that could bring that discussion up. You sound quite optimistic. Georgios Kostakos, <laughs> do you share yes, that optimism that we will eventually sort this out? With the Global Sustainability Panel and the report earlier this year, what conclusions did you draw about how possible it is going to be to convert fine words, if you like, into genuine political action? First of all, we have to be optimists. We wouldn't be in this business if we were pessimists. And uh, although there is a need for urgency, still there is time. And if we put our minds together, we can uh, have a better life in a, on a planet that can have a decent environment. So that was the message also of the panel, that we should not despair. There is a, a period of challenges, but also a period of opportunity right now, because we've never had uh, before such science, let's say, some, such knowledge of the environment and of ourselves that can help us go either way, either to self-destruct or have a better future which has to be people-centered, that's what the panel said, so we cannot, let's say, live for the science or for the economy alone, but it is about the individual, the individual around the world that in different ways has to achieve a level of development that is a well-being to be satisfactory for him or her. So that is the purpose of the panel. They wanted to contribute and revisit the idea of sustainable development, which was launched 20 years ago, but has not impl been implemented yet. It needed a bit of reimagining, or how shall we go about finally delivering it? And it's not a final stage of sustainable development. It's a process, of course, right? And we want to set it in motion more seriously and on uh, solid foundations. So the panel uh, came up with a vision which has all three elements, uh, as we discussed before, of sustainability, meaning economic, social, and environmental. Because we cannot uh, fight pollution and climate change without changing the way the economy works. Because that's contributing to it, our consumption and production patterns, right? Are the incentives that the economy and the economists and the financial people have. And also we need the, the social, meaning people need jobs, people need uh, health, uh, um, and they need also resilience to natural and human-made disasters. So how do we coordinate all these and how we bring together the people who deal with all this? Because at the country level and the global level, unfortunately, people work in silos. So here, unfortunately, and in Rio, we may not have the finance ministries or the economy ministries. We'll have many, many the foreign ministers and the environment ministers negotiating for an issue that is beyond them also. Lydia, isn't that a problem, that absence of finance measures? Because at the end of the day, economic, green economics, is probably at the heart of changing the world to a more sustainable future. Uh, well, <coughs> you know, uh, again, just following in the trend that uh, Georgia has just started, at UNESCO we believe that it's really the societies that change. It's not the economy. The societies make the economy. They are not separate. So you really have to put people in the center. And, and we talk about green societies, and green in the sense that is a society or societies that will look at the planet with the care that we should do as, as the ones living in this planet and being responsible 
for many of the changes, positive or negative. Uh, but I agree with you that, that the, the, we need a, a debate that is larger than just a sectorial uh, debate. Uh, for instance, just uh, in Sunday we are starting a, a forum on UNESCO with other partners, uh, an African forum on STI for development, uh, and, and there we have ministers of science, we have ministers of finance and planning, and we have ministers of education, because we do need to, to discuss this integration of policies that indeed can lead you to these different paths of sustainable development without reducing the well-being and, and aspirations of your people, because this is very important. People have aspirations and you have to follow, but can you find paths that are more sustainable? It's squaring a difficult circle, I know. Let me ask each of you one last question. How optimistic are you that at Rio there will be more than just fine words? There will be, people will leave Rio, politicians will leave Rio convinced that they actually have to do something. Very briefly, each one of you, Mark. Well, I think, um, you know, we can only hope, and this is a really critical time to try and do that. And to do that, we do need some really concrete suggestions, because I don't think they can just leave Rio with a better intention. They've got to leave Rio with two or three significant governance changes proposed, which might be goals of an appropriate nature. They might be a new process for a better engagement of science and policy, for example. But we need those concrete ideas, which I think are emerging, so we have potential for that. So I'm quite optimistic. Well, did you in a word um, you I, I would uh, follow mm. Mark's uh, lead on that and, and, and say that really just to look at the draft zero and the evolution that you have seen in this report, how influential it was, the policy briefs that start by influencing these reports are being now discussed by delegations that are negotiating in Rio. So for me, what is really an opportunity principally for the science community is that I think that the time is right to create this science policy interface uh, that we really need to have evidence-based policy. And, and, and Rio could be a very good example of that turning point where really science and policy makers and industry and society really come together and, and discuss uh, the issues we have in front of us. So just do you two share that optimism? Yes, indeed, uh, by, uh, let's say, having Rio as a target for a successful result, we have already started to work together and already uh, there was a lot of cooperation with the scientific community that is reflected in this report on the science policy interface. Just to make sure that we don't have too high expectations from Rio, from the main process, we hope to get some key political commitments, let's say perhaps to go on beyond GDP, to having sustainable development goals. But around Rio also, like this cooperation, we're going to have partnerships launched, like the Secretary General has the Sustainable Energy for All Partnership, which brings together um, UN agencies, governments, and the private sector uh, in order to secure access for all to energy, sustainable energy. So all these things around Rio also should be counted, and hopefully this will be a, a new beginning for all of us. Georgios, uh, Lydia and Mark, thank you all very much indeed for joining us on the Daily Planet today. Thank you. Now, as well as uh, watching us on the webcast, we want you to take part in the Daily Planet as well. Now, you can, of course, follow the whole of the plenary sessions on Twitter with the hashtag Planet2012. And, of course, we're on Facebook too and, and web streaming, as I said. But you can have your say. That's important. We want to hear from you. We want your thoughts your comments and your questions to our guests here on the Daily Planet. Um, we've got more Daily Planets uh, tomorrow uh, and every day in the conference. You can ask your question on the Facebook page or with a special Twitter hashtag for your questions, which is Ask Planet. Now, what can we learn from the past? The Earth has been subject to a lot of sudden climate changes in the past, and geologists and other scientists are beginning to get to grips with that and what that might mean for how the Earth reacts to man-made climate change in the future and how it can affect their predictions. Well, with me now is uh, Professor Sander Liu from Arizona State University and uh, Professor Eric Wolfe from the British Antarctic Survey, whose research into ice cores has revealed some of the details of, of, of past changes. Um, Eric, first... Uh, what have the ice cores told us about past uh, ice, uh, past, past sudden climate changes on the Earth? Okay, well, in the last few hundred thousand years, the Earth's gone into and come out of many ice age cycles. So ice ages mean there were ice sheets over North America, down as far as Wisconsin, over a lot of northern Europe. But it was also globally much colder. Um, those were relatively slow changes occurring over a few thousand years. But during the cold periods, we also had times when there were very fast changes 
probably caused by changes in ocean heat transport, what we in the UK here see as the Gulf Stream, but it's the whole over ocean circulation system. And that caused Northern Europe, uh, parts of North America and Greenland, for example, to warm within about 40 years by between 5 and 10 degrees. Now, that's the kind of thing that we're expecting in the next century, probably. It's certainly not a perfect analogue for, what occur, for, for what's going to occur in the future because CO2 has never in the last 800,000 years, which we can measure in ice cores, been anything like as high as it is today. So it's not the same thing, but it does provide an opportunity to kind of challenge ourselves instead of getting into this endless argument over what climate change is they're going to be, which is as far as we normally seem to be able to get, to actually move on from that and say, well, these climate changes did actually occur. We don't know exactly how human populations dealt with them, but they were small human populations. But how would today's human population, which is very large, deal with changes like that? Well, that's for you, Sandra, is it? How, do, how, how have human beings reacted in the past to, to climate change? Are we adaptable? <laughs> well, we were adaptable. We were adaptable for a very long time. For the better part of two and a half million years, us and our ancestors were very adaptable, lived in very small groups, roamed around, if they didn't find a solution to what they needed in one place, they went and got it somewhere else. And they actually simply took from the environment what they needed. The big change comes at the moment that the climate actually calms down its changes, that is the last 10,000 years. From that moment on, we see that people invest in the environment and that they therefore build a very different relationship with their environment where they don't simply pluck what is there, but actually spend time preparing the environment and then harvest what comes out of it. That makes a completely different ballpark. And I think the core difficulty that we will have in situations where we get to a climate that is resembling anything close to an ice age is that we have so much invested in our current way of living that we will not be able to maintain that that is where the crux comes and where the damage will come. Don't forget that an individual needs about 100 watts of energy to live. Right now, in the US, we use 10,000 watts per person. Most of that is gone into infrastructure, social communications, other kinds of communications. But all of that, if the circumstances change sufficiently, will actually be maybe not a total loss, but will nevertheless be very difficult to sustain. It sounds like you're predicting very, very dramatic changes in yes. the way society exists. Yes, I am. Uh, I would argue that with the perspective that is an archaeologist, which is a hindsight over a very long period, I am ultimately, I think, optimistic in the sense that I think most societies have, in the nick of time, been able to adapt to changing circumstances. But I would argue that the collateral damage, if you use that not so pleasant American word, is actually going to be quite substantive. And it will be in major part on our infrastructure that the damage actually comes. I don't remember who said it, but as we are getting poorer because we don't have all the free energy that we've had for the last two centuries, the people who are going to be able to deal with that best are actually those who are already poor. And so our part of society, Western society, in my mind, may well suffer much more than other parts of the world. It's an interesting concept. Eric, what, what does the evidence from geology, from ice cores, from past sudden climate change say to us about how big the next change is going to be. It's so different, so completely off scale, that we, we really can't say. Well, uh, no, there's some things you can say. I mean, when, when we had these very rapid changes, as I say, a large part of the Northern Hemisphere changing by perhaps five degrees in, in 40 years, you know, ecosystems evolved. You know, civiliza the, the, well, civilization wasn't really established, but the but, but ecosystems didn't, weren't destroyed. The, the life things you're talking about, aren't you, this afternoon, is, is how human beings might have adapted to those but, past but, changes, do you think they would have done? Uh, well, I'm not the expert. Sander's much more of an expert, but clearly, clearly human society, hum humanity survived. That, that's the critical thing to say. Humanity in some form or other survived. So it, we, we shouldn't be totally catastrophic. But the, but the one thing to say is that the changes that we've seen that were CO2-induced, which is coming in and out of ice ages, was partly CO2-induced. 
the rate of change was very slow compared to now. The CO2 increased by a rate of roughly 20 parts per million in a thousand years during those changes. It's increased by 20 parts per million in the last decade. So we're, we're going roughly 100 times faster in terms of the way we're forcing the climate than, than we have done in the past. So that's, you know, it is uncharted territory, unfortunately. I'd love to be able to tell everybody that we had an analogue in the past, but we don't. Very briefly, uh, yeah. Sander, do you think that humanity, if it had been around, yeah. would have survived uh, such past uh, climate changes that, that Eric has described? Well, as long as humanity did not depend on major investments in the environment, but was able to basically live off what the environment was providing, I think a lot would have actually been possible and survival would not have been that much of a challenge. I mean, it, but it is. Who among us urbanites would now be able to actually live off the land if it came to that? That is one of the core questions that we have to ask here. We have lost so much knowledge that is essential in a very rapidly changing environment that we don't know how to handle that anymore. It's interesting. Thank you both very much indeed, Professor Sander van der Loo and Professor Eric Wolf from the British Antarctic Survey. Thank you very much indeed. Right. Fascinating discussion. And that's it from The Daily Planet for today. Uh, we're back again tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. And as I said earlier, the scientists are spending the afternoon breaking out into a, a whole bunch of different sessions discussing a whole range of different topics. And in our programs uh, tomorrow, we will bring you details of some of those discussions that have been held today. But from me and the rest of the team for now, bye-bye. <laughs>